Well, good morning. Everyone will get their coffee and take a seat. We'll go ahead and try to get cranked up here as soon as we can, close to the mark. But it's great to see you all here. Thanks for braving the sort of the first real day of fall, isn't it? Um, both weather-wise and temperature-wise. And this was the very first morning of the fall I turned the heater on in my car. That's like the sign, right? It's like signal number one that you've left summer and you've headed into fall. Do you turn the heater on your car? We're actually trying to work the temperature out in here. We got here this morning. The heater was on and the AC was on. You were in that little transitional phase. You know how it is. Even at your own house, you're like part of the day you need the AC and the other part of the day you need the heater. You're like, well, which one is it? Well, you'll bear with us here patiently, I trust, as we try to figure that out. But welcome to Bible study number three. It's great to see you here as we're cranking our way through Romans. Slowly, true. We're, we're going through slowly, but we're going to get there. Um, today we got a wonderful study. I'm really excited about what's going on today, but I just want to extend a warm welcome to you. Uh, on your table, help me out here by putting your name tags on. I know that uh, when you get here, you probably forget to do that, but my suggestion is that when you arrive on a standard morning, just go ahead and put, get, go to your table, get settled in, and get your name tag on. And that way I can meet you again and not forget. So really you're just doing this for me, right? Um, just so I'm not embarrassed as I forget your name. You also see in the middle of your table there, uh, you've got a stack of notes that you can click into your little folder and track along. I trust that those of you who've figured this out by now, maybe miss a day or two, know that we're putting the video up with the outlines, and uh, that's turned out great. You might see yourself on that video now and then, uh, particularly if you stand up and walk across the room, right, in the middle of the <laughs> teaching time. I'll just have Matt follow you the whole way across the room. That way it'll deter such things. Well, let's go ahead and get started today. I want to begin today, just real briefly, with a little tidbit about RTS. One of the things I know is that some of you may not know much about the seminary, so every now and then, I think at the beginning of the study, I'll just throw a little two-minute tidbit out there so you can get to know us better. I know many of you, you may not know us, but it might be useful just to know a little bit about the seminary every now and then. Just one thing to note today, if you don't know about RTS and what we're about, you may not realize that we have a very strong missions emphasis here at the seminary. What I mean by missions emphasis is here at RTS, we are very keen not just to to take students in America and train them for American churches, but you'll find out if you know anything about us that a lot of our students actually end up all over the world. We have students literally all over the place, not just all over the place in the United States, but all over the world. We've got students church planning in China. We got students church planning in North Africa. We got students church planning in Europe. Uh, In fact, one of our sort of most well-known church plants is in Prague, Czech Republic, one of the most atheist cities in the world, if you know anything about Prague. And one of our grads years ago went and started a church there, and now two more of RTS Charlotte grads have joined them. We have three RTS Charlotte grads in Prague, Czech Republic, sharing the gospel of that city. It's really exciting to watch. One of our grads, uh, Cynthia Rubel, is uh, working in Japan, and she's been in Japan for over a decade working with orphaned Japanese children and working with pro-life ministries in Japan. And it's very exciting to see the progress she's made. You think one person can't make a difference? Think again. Um, she's made a tremendous difference. And some of you are nodding your heads because you know Cynthia and know her story. It's really exciting. We don't just have students all over the world. We actually have students from all over the world. Uh, this year, we had several students from China who are studying with us now and will go back. And they are pastors of underground churches in China. Now, you want to hear some stories. They've told us all kinds of amazing stories about how God's working there. And you never hear about it, right? Because it's always under the table, and they're trying to not get in trouble with the authorities. But one of these, one of these men who's a student here actually got converted on an exchange trip to the United States when he was a student. Went back to China, started an underground church. Now he's back studying with us, and Lord willing, he'll be back in China to further the gospel there. It's exciting to watch. We have a little map in our student lounge with our grads spread out all over the world. Nice little tidbit to know about the seminary. When you think about us, don't think about just someplace in Charlotte where people study a lot, right? Um, Yes, that happens. People study a lot here. Uh, But they study for a reason, to go out and share the gospel with the world. And that's a very exciting part of our vision. So I wanted to share that with you today as we get started. And every now and then I'll share a little tidbit with you about RTS, just so you can get to know us a little bit better and what we're about here. But today we are back in the book of Romans. So let's turn our attention there. We're in Romans chapter 1 still, and we'll be for a while. And now we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 15 today. Uh, We'll be taking somewhere between four to six verses a time, and it depends. Other parts, we may go a little bigger than this. 
But this is going to be our standard MO. I'm going to read our passage together today. And again, if you're still getting settled into the Bible study, we're looking. I'm using the ESV translation. That's okay if you don't use the ESV, just so you know. That's the translation I'll be using up here. And let me read this for us. Then we'll pray and we'll dive right into what we're talking about today. You'll recall, of course, from last week that Paul introduced himself in verses 1 through 6. And as he did so, he introduced the gospel. But then in verse 7, he starts talking about the Romans. And here's the thing I want you to think about today, is that when he introduces the Romans, he's really talking to us. As he's writing to a particular church, as we know, this this letter was meant for all the church. And this is what we're going to do today. We're going to see how Paul's description of the Romans is really just the description of Christians, which is really just a description of you and I. And so let's listen for that as we read, starting in verse 7 here. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. This is a great little text here. Let me pray as we get started, just asking that God would bless us as we study it today. Let's pray. Lord, we're reminded as we read your word that this is no ordinary book. This is a living book. Uh, empowered by your spirit. And so, Lord, we pray that that same spirit would open our eyes this morning to understand it. The two join, Lord, the spirit in us and the spirit in your word to really bring understanding. So, Lord, we pray that you would bless us today with this scripture. In Christ's name, amen. Last week, you were introduced to the Apostle Paul. And Paul starts off his letter in the standard Greco-Roman epistolary opening by starting with himself, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. And he went on We talked about all the things that were unique about Paul, how Paul described his own ministry, and then Paul, very quickly after that, as you recall from last week, sort of went off on this tangent into the gospel, and of course it's not a tangent, but in his opening it's a tangent, right, where he says, well, I'm so excited about the gospel, I've got to start talking about it now. And so Paul starts talking about the gospel right from his opening, but really it's part of that opening about what Paul's all about. But here in the second passage in our study, we'll see that Paul then transitions, And this is very typical of Paul's letters. He'll talk about himself and who he is and what he's got on his mind. Then he addresses the audience. And here he starts talking about the Roman church. And as we talked a moment ago, as I started this study, this is really important to understand that when Paul talks to the Roman church and describes them, he's not just saying, well, you and Rome happen to be like this, or this happens to be true of you and Rome. This is true for all Christians, including you and I sitting here today. And so here's what we're going to focus on today. Paul is going to unpack our Christian identity today. What are the words, what are the categories, what is the language we use to think of ourselves as a Christian? Now, this is a critical thing. Let me just even ask you today as we get started, sort of how you you think of yourself when you think of yourself as a follower of Christ. What are the words that pop into your head? What's the language you use? What are are your categories of self-identification as a believer? I would suggest to you that most of the ways we think of ourselves aren't actually the way the Bible describes us. And certainly, as we'll see in a moment, not the way that Paul describes the Romans here. Maybe when you think of yourself as a Christian, maybe you think of yourself as one who tries really hard, right? Maybe that's sort of your self-identity, as, you know, I'm just kind of working along here and doing my best. That's my thing. Uh, Maybe when you think of yourself as a Christian, maybe you think of yourself as, well, you know, the thing, when I think about it, being a Christian, that just means I'm kind of better than most people, right? Maybe that's what's in your head. Um, and we never would admit that, would we? But there's a side of us that says, well, maybe my identity is that I'm not as bad as the person down the street, right? Or maybe your identity is sort of more theological. Maybe you say, my identity as a Christian, when I think about it mostly, is I'm just a, I'm a sinner, right? I'm one who fails and makes mistakes, and even though I'm doing my best, I sin a lot. So that's my sort of core identity as a sinner, uh, before God. Now, there's a certain amount of truth of that, right? And we'll see that when Paul gets into the later chapters here, he doesn't let us escape there. He wants to make sure we really understand that we're sinners. 
But is that the primary category you think in? Interestingly, Paul has a whole different set of words. In fact, Paul has a whole different set of words that should revolutionize and transform the way you think about yourself. And think about yourself not just in your own sort of identity of self-esteem, but think of yourself in relation to what God has done for you. What you'll find today in Paul's description of you is that it's all God-centered. It's all pointing to your recipient of something, you being a recipient of something from God. So look at your outline with me today. Really, there's two things we're going to talk about today. First, Roman numeral there is what our identity is as Christians. And here we're going to focus on just a very small snippet of this passage today where Paul starts describing the people he's writing to at Rome. And so we're really going to look mainly here at verse 7. I know you're thinking, golly, I knew you were going slow, Mike, but that's really slow, right? Well, it is, but you'll see I think it's going to pay off. And then, if you flip your notes over, and we're not there yet, of course, you'll see there's a second thing, which isn't just how our own self-identity works, but how we relate to each other. One of the things that's interesting about Paul's greetings to the Romans is he sort of exposes the Christian understanding of community, what it is about, and why it matters, and what do you do in community anyway? Um, What is your horizontal relationship with others? So you may think that the book of Romans is only about a vertical relationship, right? Between you and God. But Paul says, no, if you have a right vertical relationship with God, actually it's going to span out into a horizontal relationship with others. So how you relate to each other is derivative on how you relate to God. Or to put it another way, how you relate to each other is largely determined on how you think about yourself in relation to God, your own identity. So notice the order here. Paul starts with your identity and then shows how that identity affects the way you relate to each other. Don't think they're unrelated. The way you relate to your brother or sister is is connected to how you think you're related to God, right? And this is why Paul starts in the order he does. So let's start with Roman numeral one there. Roman numeral one is really where Paul dives into the identity of us as Christians. So look down at verse seven in your notes, and you'll notice here Paul's greeting. To all those in Rome who? And I want you to notice in that short little clause, Paul mentions three things. Look closely. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called, and particularly called to be saints. And you can see under this first Roman numeral heading, I've listed out those three. That we are loved by God, and I've used the term beloved. Then we're called by God, and then we're changed by God to be saints. So we're beloved, called, saints. Now before I dive into these three individually, I want you to think about them together. And I even have a little statement in your notes there, and you can see a little double asterisk at the top there. Our identity is built on three actions that God takes towards us, and they really are in chronological order. You want to know your identity in Christ? It starts with God loving you from eternity past, actually, and we'll dive into that. It's amazing to think that God loves us in the way he does. The infinite God of the universe loves us. But then God doesn't just love us. God calls us to himself. He draws us to himself. And we actually use the term saves us, right, which is really what we're talking about. When he calls us to himself, he really opens our eyes and hearts and pulls us to himself and makes us his own. And then thirdly, he calls us to be saints, right, set apart ones. We'll talk about that. So God loves us, he draws us, and then as we'll see, he changes us, right? He makes us his followers. Notice that each of these three actions are all things God was really doing. Notice the the self-identity that I mentioned a moment ago, and I said, kind of, how do you think about yourself? I I bet you, and this is true for me, most of the time when we think about our own identity as a Christian, we think about what we're doing. Let's be honest, right? I'm trying hard. I'm trying to get to church every week. I try to get to this Bible study every week. Don't want to miss one, right? Uh, Maybe I'm I'm out trying to do good things, and we we tend to identify ourselves in Christians sort of from what we're about, what we're doing, and what efforts we're making. And make no mistake about it, the Christian life is filled with effort. I don't want you to misunderstand. But that's not where Paul starts. Paul starts with your identity as what God has done. Every one of these descriptions is a received thing, right? God loved you, God called you, God changed you. And that changes the game entirely, because if your identity is very God-centered and very much about what he's doing, then what's that do to your life? It takes that weight off your shoulders, doesn't it? And you think, you know, my identity as a Christian is not necessarily something I'm always doing, even though we do do things as Christians, but really it's about what God has done. To put it another way, our identity as Christians is is mainly in the past tense as much as it is in the present, right? So what God has already done for me and in me, not just what I'm trying to do in the present. 
So let's dive into these three things and just talk about how they're connected here. And I want to start with the first one, and I've put it in your uh, notes there, point A, as beloved. The ESV says, loved by God, and that's perfectly fine for the translation of this word. It's agapetois in Greek. It's from the word agape. It just means loved one, right? Or the better way, you're the beloved of God. This is a stunning thing to think about. Think about what Paul could have said here as he started off your description as your identity of Christians. He doesn't say to the Romans, dear Romans who love God. Now, do the Romans love God? Sure. Absolutely. Should Christians love God? Absolutely. Do I hope that you and I love God? Well, sure. But notice that's not where Paul starts. He doesn't say, look, I'm really excited to write to you because I know you love God. No, he says you are loved by God, right? You are, you are God's beloved ones. You're the ones that God has poured out his love on from eternity past. You are the recipients of the divine affection of God himself. What's unique about the church in Rome is that Paul writes to them and says, I got the greatest news for you in the world. Remember, Paul's talking about the gospel here. Good news, right? You know what the great news is that God loves, God is love, the Christian message is about love, and you Romans tucked away in this very difficult situation in Rome, we'll say more about that later, you are the recipients of that divine love. So there is a sense in which this is defining us not by our disposition towards God, but really we're defined by God's disposition towards us. Now, truthfully, you go around the world today and say that to people, and they're going to be like, eh, of course God loves me, that's his job, right? Some people will hear the fact that God loves them, and they'll shrug their shoulders and say, eh, no big deal, of course, I'm very lovable, right? Uh, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't God love me? But Paul's getting ready to change the game in the next few chapters where he says, this thing I told you about how God loves you, that should shock you. It should surprise you. Why? Because you're really not as lovable as you think. In fact, on the contrary, you're actually a sinner and really often disobey God and break his law and really flaunt God often in your life. And you know what's amazing is that even in the midst of that, God still loved you and still loves you. In fact, I included another verse from Paul there in your notes. This is from Ephesians. Look down at that. This is a stunning statement. Paul's very similar here. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Okay, notice he starts with who, with the way you were, right? There was a problem. You were dead. You were lost. You weren't a great person. But notice the next phrase there, but God. I love that. I love that little transition. Things were lost for you. You were hopeless. You were in trouble. You were not lovable, but God. God acted. Notice how God where this is again. Notice that's about what God has done. But God, being rich in mercy, notice the place I've italicized there, because of the great love which he loved us when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Here is the divine mystery of the Christian gospel. This is what Paul wants to understand. The gospel of Christianity is all about being one who's loved by God. That should be your core identity. Of course you love God. Of course you want to strive to love God more in all the ways you do it, but your core identity is I'm the recipient of something. My identity is tied up in what I've received. Remember what 1 John says? It's not that we love God, but we love God because he first loved us, right? That is the gospel. It's God first loved us, and that's why we love him. So here's the thing. Your love of God is a a reaction. Your your love of God is a response to something, namely his love for you, okay? Don't think that you love God first, and then God says, wow, look at that person down on earth loving me. I think I'll love them back, right? Let's have a relationship as if you took the initiative. No, God says, you don't understand. I took the initiative. I loved you when you were unlovable. Now, this is one of the core things I want you to see here, and this little bullet point under point A says this. When God decided to set his love on us, he didn't do it because of our merit. It's not that God looked out in the world and said, hmm, let's see now, who stands out to me that I really like and that I really want to put my love on that I think is really fantastic? You know, kind of like looking for a spouse, you know? When you go look for a spouse or a, uh, for you or you're looking for a husband or I'm looking for a wife in our past, we thought, you know, look, you know, I'm going to look for somebody who's great, right, who's wonderful, so I can put my love on them. And we think that God does that to some extent with us, right, that he works like humans do. He looks down there and says, who has a lot of merit that I can pour my love on? And then you realize, hold on a second, what makes the gospel good news is the opposite of that, which is God decided to pour out his love on a people who have no merit. In fact, I include another little verse for you here which is one of my favorite in the Bible. You might think, Mike, one of Mike's favorite verses in the Bible is in Deuteronomy. I haven't even read Deuteronomy in the last 10 years, right? But look down at Deuteronomy 7. This is one of my favorite verses, and you'll see why in a moment. Paul's talking, to, or uh, God is talking to Israel here. It was not because you were more in number 
than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. Okay, pause for a moment, Israel. Don't think God loved you because he looked down and said, wow, what a great nation, right? In fact, look at the next statement. He says, for you were the fewest of all peoples, and you probably could have gone longer here and say, you know, Israel, you're kind of a mess. You were not the greatest nation. You had all kinds of problems. You were the fewest people. And you're thinking, so God didn't love Israel because of her merit. So why did God love her? Look at the next statement. But, it, and that should be but, there's a typo there. But it is because the Lord loves you. Now, did you catch that? You're like, well, that's circular, right? God didn't set his love on you because you're so great, Israel. He set his love on you because he loves you. And you're thinking, well, you didn't really answer the question. And that's, of course, part of the point is that why does God love us? Well, we can say this, not because of our own merit, but then we ask, well, why is it that God loves us? And the answer is because he loves you. There is a divine prerogative here where God sets his love on his people in a way that's not merited by him in the divine mystery. We don't know why he chose to love us, but we know it wasn't because we were the greatest on earth. In fact, on the contrary, he loves us in spite of our sin, but God loves us. And here's the thing I want you to think about with this first point, is that Paul wants you to recognize that the Bible is actually the greatest love story ever written. You know, some people are really into romances. I imagine no one in this room is, but um, some people are. My seminary students are, but not, I'm sure no one here um, are into romances. And they love to hear love stories, right? And we love books that are romances and movies that are romances. All of those, I suggest to you, are actually founded on, when they make sense at least, the greatest romance ever told, which is God's love for his people. Do you know that the Bible structures God's love for his people like a marriage from beginning to end in the Bible? That he has a bride, his people, whom he loves. And here's the thing about this romance is his bride didn't love him back, at least not at first. And so he had to woo her and chase her and draw her to himself and romance her and save her and redeem her and purify her. And the whole story of the Bible all the way up to the present is God chasing after his bride. The story of Christianity isn't that the church is so great. The story of Christianity is that God is so great that he loves his bride. It's the greatest love story in the world, which is why at the very end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, what is it? A great wedding. Every time you go to a wedding, and I know you love weddings, right? Every time you go to a wedding, and every time I do a wedding, I remind people that this wedding is great and it's wonderful, but don't mistake, this isn't really the wedding that you should be looking forward to. There's a greater wedding coming. It's because God is someday going to be completely united with his people in a way that he never has before when he returns. The Bible's the greatest love story in in, in the world. And Paul starts off by saying, you are in that love story. You are the loved, right? You are the bride. You are the one that God is wooing. What great news to start off. Paul isn't done, though, here. I want you to notice he gives us a second thing that he describes us of, and that he says that we're called. So notice back in verse 7 again, he says, you're loved by God and called. Now, don't mistake this. Some people take the phrase, called to be saints, as one whole phrase, okay? In the Greek, I need you to understand that even though it's connected, there's two separate things going on here. Paul isn't saying, when you're called to be saints, that you're given the name saints so that when they call you something, they call you saints, as if it's kind of like a name, like they call me Mike, or they may call you something. That's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying that you're called to be saints, And the only reason you are saints is because God calls you to himself to get you there. And so you have to realize that called here is really a second stage in the trio, right? God is saying, I love you, but I'm not going to leave you where you are. I'm going to call you to myself. I want you to think about this for a moment. God loves sinners, right, who don't love him back. So how does God begin a relationship with a sinner that doesn't love him back when he already loves that sinner? Answer is he calls that sinner to himself. He draws that person to himself and brings them to him. This term is very widespread in the Bible. I included it there in your notes. Clay toy in the notes is the Greek word here, called. And you can look this up in a number of different contexts, but most of the time when it's used, it's almost always used to describe God's inward call on us to draw us to himself. How he opens our eyes, softens our heart, woos us to himself in a special way by his spirit. It's him saving us, okay? In fact, I included a corollary verse there underneath that, John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Wow. Now, there's a statement for you. Notice how Godward again, Paul's being here. He's saying, look, I want you to realize that when God loved you, you loved you as a sinner, but then he wanted to bring you to himself, and he did that by calling you inwardly to himself. Okay? He made an initiation with you. It's not that you woke up one day and said, you know, I really want to love God. No, God loved you and drew you to himself. And you couldn't come to God 
unless God drew you to himself. Why is that? I want you to look at that little second bullet point. Why do we need God to call him to himself? Let's just think about this for a moment. Here, I open it up to you. What, what, what is true about us that, 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 that keeps us from just waking up one day and saying, you know, I think I'll love God? Say that again. Yes, exactly. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, a point that Paul is going to develop very fully in a moment. Okay, But notice the word that she emphasized there, and Paul emphasized that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, right? We weren't sick. We weren't a little upset stomach in our trespasses and sins, right? We weren't sort of not ourselves fully in our trespasses and sins. We were dead. How do you get a dead man to believe in you? Well, you can't. If you talk to a dead man, they're, they're dead. They're unresponsive. You have to first bring them to life, right? What you're getting at here in the idea of called is that God, in one sense, is recogn- or we're recognizing that God, in one sense, for us to have a relationship with him, has to be the initiator. He has to be the beginner. He has to be the one who goes after us and opens our heart and opens our minds. Here's the thing I want you to realize, and this goes back to the deadness of trespasses and sins, is that when you're not a Christian, you don't even want to be a Christian, Right? We'll see in Romans chapter 3 that someone who's not a believer in God doesn't even seek God, really, doesn't even want to be with God, doesn't, has animosity in their heart towards God, okay? And so there's a sense in which God has to first initiate with us. And so why do we uh, need God to call us to himself? Because we cannot believe in God on our own. Now, this gets into what is called the doctrine of election, okay? The doctrine of election is just this, that God calls people to himself. Um, Now, Paul deals with this later in the book of of, uh, Romans, particularly in Romans 9, so we're not going to dive into it all here. I know you may have a zillion questions about it. But here, what you have to realize is that from Paul's perspective, the reason you're a Christian is not because of you. The reason you're a Christian is because of God doing something in your heart and mind to initiate it. I want you to think about this really like two people sitting in the pew hearing a sermon. Think about it for a moment. Imagine you go to church, and there's two people sitting in the pew, both non-Christians, And they're both listening to the same sermon, and when the sermon is over, one believes in Christ and trusts in him fully, and one does not. That happens, I suppose, all the time. What's the difference? Why does one person in the pew believe and another person in the pew not believe? Some people will tell you that the person who does believe can sort of take credit for that to some extent, right? They're like, well, I believe because I was smarter than that other guy over there, right? Um, I'm more enlightened. I'm just brighter. I did pretty good on the SAT, you know, when I got into college. And so when I heard the gospel, I got it more quickly, right? Or, you know, I come from a family of very intelligent people, or I just had the willpower to do it, or I'm just more moral or something like this. No. If you understand the whole biblical teaching about calling, what you have to realize is that the reason that you're a Christian is because God drew you to himself, not because you woke up someday and decided to follow him. Now, that is a very humbling idea, is it not? Think about it. Where's the room for boasting at that? You, you believe because God first loved you. No room to boast at all. Ruth? Um, I, I think Thomas very briefly in the role of doctrine plays in all of this. Yes. Adoption, if you're thinking about it in terms of the order of what God does, um, calling, God calling you to himself and opening your eyes and opening your mind and opening your heart so you can believe in the gospel is part of what we're talking about here. But then once you believe in Jesus, he makes you his own child. And that's what we're talking about under the heading of adoption. And that actually comes up later, particularly in Romans chapter 8. Paul actually takes the whole what he calls order of salvation and puts it all in order. How you go from an unbeliever all the way to glory, Paul lays it out in order for you. And there's a Latin phrase for that called the ordo salutis, order of salvation. Um, And I'm tapping into a little bit here, but it starts with God loving you. And then it starts secondly with God calling you to himself. And then there's other ones in that order. One of those is adoption. Um, which is God sort of making you his own child and loving you. And that's part of uh, being part of the family of God. God loves you even before you're converted, right, even before you're a Christian. But once you are drawn to himself and believe, there's a sense here which you become a special child of God, which is really what we're talking about when we're talking about adoption. So this very much should revolutionize your sense of your own role in your salvation. And it should be the most humbling thing on the planet, right? But also the greatest news on the planet. If you're saved not because of what you have done, but because of what God has done, then guess how secure your salvation is? Very secure. Why? Because it's in the hands of God. It's not up to you. And this is a tremendous important point. Yes? Yeah, that's a tricky question, right? 
So if God calls certain people to himself, then the flip side of that is, well, then some people aren't called, right? And this is where we get into the doctrine of election. I mean, it's a complicated issue, which I'm going to unpack at a later point. You're thinking, wow, let's do it now, right? Um, I wish we could. We're like two words in here, so we can't do it now. But that's a great question and an important concept. And you know what's interesting? Paul dives into that full bore, particularly in Romans chapter 9. He says, okay, I'm going to take the gloves off. We're going to get busy here. Let's talk about election and, and how and why God saves some and not all. We know the Bible is very clear that God saves some and not all. Um, that's not in doubt. And the question is, how does that go about? What Paul wants to make it clear here is that the fact that you're in and not out is not because of your greatness. And it's not because you figured it out. It's not because you were smarter. It's because God called you, drew you to himself. There's a third word here I want us to look at. And this is the word saint. Now, that's a word that I imagine nobody used when we talked about uh, your self-identity. If I said, how do you think about yourself as a Christian? And if you had in your mind, I'm a saint, you probably would have even balked at that and thought, well, I shouldn't say that, right? Because if I say that, that's kind of arrogant, isn't it? If I say saint, that means I really think I'm great. Um, And if I say saint, well, that's not true because really I'm a sinner, and so how do I qualify that? But notice what Paul does. End of Romans, uh, or sorry, end of verse 7 here, he's very clear. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called, called for what purpose? To be saints. Paul does something that should shock us here. He uses the term saint for every believer. Paul doesn't say, hey, you know, I really hope someday you can aspire to being a saint. Maybe some of you in Rome are going to be that great, right, that someday you could be a saint, and I'll wait and see. No, Paul doesn't say that. Paul doesn't say, hey, look, some of you in Rome are saints, and uh, hey, you know, good for you, right? Maybe the other ones will catch up at some point. Now, here's the thing. Paul says Christians are saints, and he uses this term across the board for Romans. He does this elsewhere, too, not just to Rome. You can see in multiple letters he writes, and at some point you can go back and look at the greetings Paul does in his other letters. There's 13 of them, 12 others besides this one you can sift through. And very often, Paul describes his audience as saints. Now, what's he thinking here? Does he not know that when Christians in Rome try to follow Christ that they're falling on their face, just like we do often, that they they mess up, that they're sinful people, that they make mistakes? Is Paul naive Is he oblivious to these things? Is he just overly optimistic? What's going on here with Paul? Well, this is why I want you to really think about what he's doing here. Paul is not overly optimistic. He's not naive. He's not unaware of all these issues. What he wants you to recognize is that when you are called to God, remember step two, and God God brings you to himself in a relation with himself, what he does at that point is he sets you apart for his own purposes. And that's what it means to be a saint. Look at the little Greek word there, agios, in your notes. This is the word for holy, Uh, and really it's just a plural adjective. It just means holy ones. To be a saint is to be a holy one. Now, you may, even sitting here this morning in this Bible study, think to yourself, I don't feel very holy, right? You might think, I don't feel like I'm a holy one. In fact, even this morning, I yelled at my kids on the way out the door, you know. I'm mad at my dog for chewing up something, and I don't feel like a saint. Okay, but you're missing the point Paul wants you to see, is that when you become a Christian, There's a decisive break with your past, okay? There's a decisive transition that happens with your past, and you're put on the trajectory of holiness. Paul wants you to realize that the reason he calls you a saint is because you're on the pathway of holiness. You're on the pathway of being set apart for God. You are not any longer enslaved to your old patterns of sin. Now, Paul, interestingly, is going to dive completely into this subject in a later chapter. In fact, in chapter 6, he's going to sort of expound this more fully about how you can be a saint and and not set apart uh, for uh, these same purposes. But what I want you to see here is that Paul just sort of very much touches on this at this point and wants us to realize that to be a saint is to be someone on a trajectory of holiness, on the pathway towards following God, and therefore set apart for God's purposes. You don't realize that God has a goal for your life, and the goal for your life isn't what you think it is, or wish it was, probably. You know, what we all wish God's goal for our life was? Well, that I would be happy, right? Uh, What I wish God's goal for my life was that it would be easy and smooth and simple, you know, that I would have this house or this car and this situation or this husband or this bank account or what have you. We have this idea of what we wish God would do for our life, but God says, actually, I have a totally different idea, is that my goal for you is to set you apart for my purposes totally. And I want you to make you 
holy. Holiness is part of the Christian life. Now, God realizes the minute you're saved, you're not holy. The minute you're saved, you're, of course you've still got all the old baggage. And throughout the whole, your rest of your life, you're going to have old baggage that you're struggling with and always dealing with and always fighting. And no one in this life will ever attain perfection remotely. But, Paul says, when you become a Christian, five seconds after you become a Christian, you are a saint because you're on the trajectory of holiness. You are headed down that path, and God has set you apart for himself. And this is what Paul means when he talks about uh, holiness and, uh, and uh, being a saint. That does raise this issue, then, that Christians ultimately should be striving to be different from the world. Holiness really is part of the Christian life. It's something we should be headed towards and desiring. Paul is giving you an identity here. He was saying, I want you to realize that I'm going to give you an identity sort of ahead of time. You aren't a saint yet in, in terms of being 100% perfect, but you're a saint in terms of where you're headed. And where are you headed someday? Glory in heaven with God. And guess what? There you will be perfected. There you will be holy. There you will be perfect in every way. And so Paul, what he does, he takes your end game and he imports it back onto you now and says, I don't want to forget who you really are. Don't think of yourself as your old self. Think of yourself as your new self. Because that's where you'll be. And this is what I tell Christians all the time, is if they hear, if Christians hear the, the concept of holiness and the idea of purity and don't like it, what I always say is that you're not going to like heaven very much, right? Because that's what it is. It's, it's purity and it's holiness uh, there. And God is preparing us to be there. Uh, someday we will be saints in the perfected sense, but now we're saints sort of in principle, if you will. So I want you to look at this little question at the bottom of your page. If Paul wants you to realize that the real you is the saint part, okay, you're always battling this sort of two sides of you. The real you is the saint. I want you to look at the little question there. How does realizing you're a saint affect the way you respond to sin in your life? Or how should it? Maybe is the better question. Let me just open it up here. Another way to ask this question is, if you realize you're a saint, and that's your identity, rather than just something that you think is unattainable, then how does that affect the way you live? or should affect the way you live? There's all kinds of answers to this question. Yeah. How so? Because what? Yeah, here's a, if you didn't hear it, she goes, it causes you to grieve in a different way over your sin, right? Why? Because you look at your sin differently. What if your core identity was, I'm a sinner? Then when you sin, what do you think? That's nah, just what sinners do. Right Now, make no mistake about it, you are a sinner, okay? And I am too, and Paul's going to make that very clear, and you will be for the rest of your life. But, but that's not the same thing as saying that's your core identity. You can be a sinner, but your core identity is the new man, not the old man. If your core identity remains sinner, which you'll notice, by the way, Paul never starts off his letters that way. Dear sinners in Rome. <laughs> Dear saints. What is he saying? If you think of yourself that way, you're going to react differently in terms of the way you interact with the world. Okay, you had a thought. Yes. Right. The hope, she mentioned that it gives you hope of what you will be someday. Do you, if you're like me, most of the time you're very, very dissatisfied with who you are, right? You ever look at the mirror in the morning and say, man, and I don't mean physically, right? You may be dissatisfied there too, I don't know, but I'm not talking about physically. You ever look in the mirror in the morning and say, I just wish I was a different person. I just wish I didn't act this way or behave this way. I wish I wasn't beholden to the sins I'm beholden to. I wish I wasn't failing over in this area. Here's the hope, is that you are on the pathway to being a saint. In fact, already are in principle, according to Paul. Is it, it's not a defeatist thing. It's that God some ways, someday is going to change you entirely, and in the meantime, he wants you to make progress into that end. Why? Because you're earning your way to heaven? No, you're not earning your way to heaven by being holy. Holiness is a response to God setting you apart for himself. Okay, all of this is God word. God loved you, God drew you to himself, God changes you. Okay? These are the three identifiers of what it means to be a Christian. When you think about yourself, this will revolutionize your life. Is that I'm a beloved one. I'm a call. God, God stepped in and called me and saved me. Not because I'm great. And then God is he's busy changing me right now to be something I'm not. 
If you think about those categories, think about how different those are than the other categories. Well, someone who tries really hard, you know, someone who, you know, tries to go to church now and then, or someone who actually loves God, I mean, that's not bad, but notice that, again, Paul positions it completely in the opposite direction. What, you, what I want you to take away today as you think about these things is a transformed identity, okay? I want you to think about yourself differently. You know, when our world says you need to think about yourself differently, you know what they mean? They mean just think better of yourself. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to, to think better of yourself in the sense of self-esteem. I'm asking you to think of yourself differently in light of who God is and what he's done for you. And that's what's radically different about the Christian self-identity and a worldly self-identity, okay? The word self occurs in both, but don't let that trick you, right? Even though it's about self, it's not about self and the Christian self-identity, right? Because everything we say about ourselves is ultimately what God has done for us from the outside. What is Paul tapping into here? He's tapping into a word he hasn't used yet, but he's going to use it, and it's going to be basically the theme of the whole book. He's tapping into a word called grace, okay? Grace is driving all three of these things, which is that God, the Christian message is about what God has done, not about what you have done. That's the essence of the Christian message, and that's what grace is. Grace is God showing favor to you in spite of your sin. A lot of people will define grace as unmerited favor, but we're going to find some of the different out when we get in Paul's letters. We're going to find grace as an unmerited favor. Grace is demerited favor. Okay? It's not that you didn't deserve grace. It's that you deserve the opposite of grace. And that's a big difference. And Paul's saying, and in spite of all that, look what God has for you. These three things, beloved called saints. And I want you to almost think of it as a hyphenated word. Beloved called saints is what you are. Okay? And this should be transformative um, as you think about this. Okay, any final comments, thoughts, or questions on our self-identity before we say a few words about our community life here? I thought I saw a hand or two there before we move on. Yep? I know you don't have a lot of this for this, so if you go two forward, could you kind of tie that with us where you live? Ah, yes. Yeah, great question. Um, so how do I present this in evangelistic context? That's a big question. Paul actually was going to deal with that a little bit later in certain places. Um, but I think the way we present the message of the good news is we say, look at what God does uh, uh, to save the people for himself, and if you trust in Jesus Christ, um, you will be saved, which is an absolutely true promise. We can say that to anybody. Anybody on the planet, and this is what, of course, Paul does, says to everyone, you trust in Jesus Christ, you will be forgiven of your sins, and adopted in the family of God. Now, behind that, Paul, of course, knows that when he says to someone, trust in Jesus Christ, that some just refuse to. And it's only if God comes in and opens their eyes that they eventually will. But that doesn't take away the impetus to share the gospel with them, right? You're still going to give them the gospel message, even though you know God has to work. But what would the opposite be? What if God didn't work? What if it was all up to them? Would that encourage you in your evangelism? If it was all up to the person you're talking to, and that God never intervenes and saves people? but that it's all just sort of, sort of, uh, sort of up to the person you're, you're, you're sharing the gospel with? Yeah, you'd be basically trying to talk them into it um, in some sense, and really you would have very little hope to change a darkened heart. Um, the only hope in evangelism is if God really does soften hearts and opens minds. Or another way to say it, the only hope in evangelism is if God calls people to himself. And so when I go out and share the gospel, I can have confidence, you know something, God does call people to himself, and maybe it's this person I'm talking to right now. It's a very optimistic way to think about it. All right, let's flip the notes over. Look on the back of your page there, Roman numeral 2. I am way out of bounds here in terms of where I want to be on time, but that's all right. Uh, that's how these things go. Uh, any study like this is going to have ebb and flow to it, but it's actually the main point of Roman numeral 1 is where I wanted to spend most of our time today. But let's say a few things about Roman numeral 2 on the back. How do we relate to each other now? Here's the interesting thing. Paul lays out three things in this section of 8 through 15 that at least give us an insight into Christian community. And these three things won't work unless the identity is there. These three things, as you'll see, flow out of your identity and my identity as a beloved called saint. But let's just see what Paul has to say about each of these one at a time, starting in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Notice the very opening salvo Paul does in his horizontal relationship with the Romans is he gives us a principle that in terms of how we relate to each other, there should be a profound thankfulness amongst the saints for how God is working in each other's lives. 
And Paul, by making the statement of the Romans, brings that principle out. And I want you to think about this in a historical context for a moment. Why do you think Paul was so thankful for the Romans? Here's Paul, and the very first thing he says to them after his little introduction and after he identifies them, he says, look, I want you to know I'm really thankful for you guys. Make no mistake about it. I'm so glad that you all are there. Why? What do you think is in Paul's minds here that would make him start off with this idea of thankfulness in his letter to the Romans? Ruth? Okay, so he sees another church popping up, and he's like, look, the gospel's working. It's advancing. The kingdom's growing, right? So that's one, certainly a great reason to be thankful. What else? Isn't that, isn't that exactly right? If you didn't hear what Sonny said, he's like, look, I'm, I've been wanting to get to Rome, and I'm excited to know the gospel's already sort of gotten there ahead of me. But I want you to think about in the context of the first century. If you were a Christian in the first century, this little fledgling operation, right, just infants, got, you know, Christ has started this church, and you're sort of trying to make it, trying to make it. And what is the big city in your world? The big city in your world is Rome, right? And is Rome friendly to Christianity? Is Rome positive towards the Christian faith? No, this is sort of a very dark place. Uh, very much a place opposed to the faith, very much a place that has no light at all, spiritually speaking. And it is the most powerful city in the world. And Paul writes to them and says, boy, am I thankful you guys are there. You can get a little bit of what he's thinking of here. He's saying, in the midst of where the church is growing, not only am I just glad it's growing, but I'm particularly glad it's growing in Rome, right? Because if there's any place to be encouraged about, it's great to know the gospel has reached the most powerful city in the world in that time. And Paul says, even the gospel is going there. This is a great example in Scripture of the power of what other Christians are doing and how that can encourage you. You ever ever had a situation, I mean, we can think about a a parallel example now. I mean, think about how much we want the good news of Christ to go into the Middle East, into the Muslim world where the gospel just isn't there. What if you got news, or even in China, that there's this body of believers there preaching the gospel and that there's a church there and it's growing? Isn't that encouraging to you? Like, oh, it's great news. It's there. That means it's, it's expanding. It's growing. It's working. Paul writes to the Romans saying, you don't understand how exciting it is, how thankful I am to see God working through you. This is a principle of the Christian community that don't underestimate for a moment the power of the example of another Christian's life. Here's what you believe, and I believe it too, unfortunately, from time to time. You believe that what I do really doesn't impact anybody, and what I do doesn't really matter it really is, I'm just going to sort of, you know, go through my life, and it doesn't really change anything. That's not true. How many times have you seen just even one other believer stand up for truth in some context, and you find yourself encouraged, and you find yourself thankful, and you realize, wow, just this fellow sister or brother who's no one special, not a pastor, just did something, said something, stood up for something, and I watched it happen, and I realized that just is fantastic. I'm encouraged by that. This room right here is an example of the body of Christ, even though we come from different churches. And one of the things that Paul wants us to realize is that one of the core blessings of being in the body of Christ is the way that you are examples to one another and how you can look into each other's lives and show tremendous thanks for what God is doing there. Notice what Paul says shouldn't be there. He says this by silence. He doesn't say the body of Christ shouldn't be represented by envying one another or competing with one another. Or sort of striving to outdo one another, but thankful to one another. Notice Paul doesn't look at Rome and go, golly, they beat me to it. <laughs> I wanted credit for that. I wanted to go and start the church in the biggest city in the world so that I could say I did it. Paul doesn't do that. Paul's the, this great apostle. He could have easily said, you know, I wanted to be the guy to kick off Rome. But another one beat him to it. And he's like, I'm so glad. Here's the question for you. How often do you look at a brother or sister in Christ and find them doing well in the Christian life and find, unfortunately, in your heart, not thankfulness but envy? Or you find yourself even competing with them. Paul says, you need to take that off the table. You need to recognize that when other people do well in the faith, that that is a great thing to be thankful for. There needs to be a spirit of mutual thankfulness for each other, even in this room. That everyone needs to be appreciative of what gifts God has given to another, how God is blessing the ministry of another. So you didn't charge the church at Rome. No big deal. Someone did, and that's great news. There's this sense, then, that thankfulness should dominate the experience horizontally among Christians. And this is exactly what we see here. There's a second thing Paul does, though. You can see it in your notes after verse 8. Notice verse 9. 
For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. We won't spend much time on this, but Paul is a big prayer, as you know, from all kinds of different places in the New Testament. That's another thing that should mark the Christians across the board, is not only that you are thankful for each other, not competing with each other, but that you're praying for each other. And by the way, those go together. If you're competing with someone and envious about them, are you going to pray for them? Not, well, maybe imprecatory prayers, but uh, I'm not talking about that, right? You're not going to pray that God will bless them. What we have is a, a harmonious community of faith. Prayer flows out of that thankful heart and that desire to see things advanced. But look at point C. Mutually encourage one another. Just look again at verse 11 and following. This is really the core of it here. Paul says, for I long to see you. Notice the relational component there. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Here's an amazing thing. The Apostle Paul saying, you know what, I am excited to come visit you, Romans, because I need to be encouraged too. Notice Paul doesn't say, well, you guys are, don't know anything there and I'm really the bright theologian, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to teach you everything, and you're going to be much better off for me having visited. No, that's not Paul at all. Paul comes and says, I can't wait to see you. I long to be with you. Why? So we can mutually encourage each other. I can tell you this today. If the apostle Paul needs community, and if the apostle Paul needs each other to be mutually encouraged, then you do too. There's two different types of people in this room, and I'm going to be overly simplistic. There's introverts and extroverts. And then there's everything in between, I know. But we all, both of those miss the community angle in the way Paul intends it. Introverts miss it because they just don't engage. Extroverts miss it because they engage often for social reasons that have nothing to do with mutual encouragement. What Paul is saying here is that not only do I want you to engage, but I want you to engage in a way that it's Christ-centered and encourages each other's faith. Don't confuse social time with Christian community. Does Christian community have a social dimension? Absolutely. Does Christian community have a social aspect? Sure, but don't think that just having social time is Christian community. Christian community is about mutual encouragement in the Lord. This is why both extroverts and introverts have a danger of missing it. Introverts miss it because they don't engage. Extroverts miss it maybe because they just think social time is enough. No, Paul says both of you need to realize there's something else going on here. When community comes together, Mutual encouragement takes place. And by the way, that's why we have you at tables in here. You may think, well, they have us at tables last morning to put my coffee. Great. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, I'm at a table for other reasons. But you're at tables so you can get to know each other. Notice this is not a lecture where you all lined up in rows and I teach and leave. We want to have some community, right? And that's really what this, is, this sort of last phase of every Wednesday is designed for. So look down at the bottom of your page to those questions. Um, I've got three here, and let me remind the discussion leaders again that we're not talking here about you know, having to necessarily, mechanically go through the questions one at a time, although that's fine. It could just be a starting point, and you could just let the group uh, reflect upon the two things a day. So here's what I want you to talk about in your groups. The Christian identity, how your understanding as a beloved called saint is transformative for you, and also this idea of community. Mutual encouragement, whether you've really engaged that, uh, whether you've really embraced that. And so those are uh, some opportunities for you to discuss those questions today. So let's, let's do that transition, and let me start us by offering a word of prayer, and then we'll break into these groups together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just rejoice in the good news that we saw today. We're loved, amazing love that we can't even comprehend. Lord, solidify our identity, not only as beloved called saints, but also our identity in relation to one another. This is what you envision for the community of Christ, so transformative and so glorious that one day we'll be realized fully in heaven. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.